Hey, I'm Mike Sheridan and this is The Delve. Philly McMahon is a best-selling and award-winning author, a personal trainer and business owner, and a six-time All-Ireland winner with Dublin. He's as well known for his passions off the pitch as on, with his work in the community in Ballymun and the working class people of Dublin, a testament to his character. Philly owns and coaches in BD7 Transformations on the north side of Dublin. Billy, thanks, Mill, uh, for coming in. Um, the, first, the first time I met you or seen you speak, I think it was, it was at the Tatler Man Awards a couple of years ago. Mm. And I know your girlfriend, Sarah, a little bit. So I went up and said hello afterwards because the speech that you made at the, you, you won an award, was it Man of the Year you won? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. yeah. But you didn't know you were going to win that award. And I was no. convinced that you just, I was like, oh my God, he's such a good speaker. He obviously mm. has this slick way of doing it. And you were like, and Sarah was like, no, he, he didn't know he was going to win. No, no. Uh, where did that confidence come from to be able to speak publicly? Is it from the guys? Is it from <sighs> competing? Um, I'm not sure. I think uh, I've got to a stage in life where I'm not too worried about others. <laughs> and when you're not too worried about others when you public speak and you know, you know your topic, it's kind of it's 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 quite easy to do. But I think people when they public squeak, come on, squeak, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm getting I'm flustered now. But when people public speak, it's. Um, they're just worried about what other people think of them and, and um, that kind of puts them off a little bit. So I've developed a few tricks over the years of just being able to, um, first of all, obviously the, the main one, make sure you know your topic and make sure you're comfortable speaking about your topic. And um, and that's and then just stuff like making sure you're going at a certain speed and all that stuff. So, but yeah, uh, I was asked to go to the, to the awards um, and... Uh, I knew brother Kevin was there and stuff like that, and and uh, I just said, "Look, I'd go in," and I was around town, and yeah, I won, and I was like, "Wow, this is this is weird." And a couple of hours before that, I was actually over in um, Conley Station, uh, doing stuff at Beata House, and so it was nice to uh, to give them a shout out for all the good work they do. But where where do you find the time? Because you have your own business as well, you have your own gym, and mm. I know you you do stuff in Mount Joy as well as Beata House stuff, and and a bunch of other things as well. How do you find the time to to be, I mean, essentially a professional athlete? I mean, you're training like a professional athlete with the Dublin team, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, we, we train probably four or five nights a week, uh, including the weekends maybe as well. I suppose I, from a long time, I struggled with time management and I've tried to condense that down into energy management now and, and look at the, the amount of energy I'm spending in certain periods of my life, like, you know, so... You know, there was a study done there a couple of weeks ago and it came out that GA players spend 30 hours a week, on average 30 hours a week playing the sport or training. And with 40, 40 to 50 hours a week on, on, on my business, uh, there's not much left, like, you know. So I'd have probably, if, if I'm sleeping eight hours a day, which is probably what I don't get, but I try to, I'd probably have about four or five hours left to live. Yeah. So... Um, for me, it's when I'm spending time. For example, I went for a meal with my mum yesterday. I didn't really want to go. I had in my mind to go for breakfast, and and then I was going to the the Bohemians at Cork City match, and I just I said to myself, no, this this can be good quality time with my mum, like you know. So she was like, oh, can we go for food? And I was like, oh, in my head, I didn't want to go, but I was like, yes, this is the prime example of me trying to spend good energy with somebody. So, and I went and spent an hour with my mum. That could have been the equivalent of you know, previous to, to the way my, my education developed to five or six hours. So getting the quality, I think, is very important when, you've, when you're, you're struggling with time. Where did that, where did that come from? Because that's something you see, you see with a lot of elite athletes, mm. where they know exactly where to put the time. It was obviously a conscious decision with you to know where to put your energy. Yeah, like, um, I think like there's, there's five or six things as, as human beings that we try to kind of juggle, like, you know. Um, you know, you have your health, your spirituality, you have your personal development, um, or the other two. You would have your career and your your, your job, obviously. Um, I can't forget, the, that's how important it is, I can't forget yeah. the last one, but there's five basically that you try to juggle around. It could be hobbies or something that, that might link it to personal. But some of them, you, you would hear a lot of personal development coaches talk about some of these balls that they drop them a glass and they break and some of them bounce back up, like, you know. So basically, you need to do these certain things, like, you know. So for, for us, uh, for me, sorry, and for certainly for yourself, you, you know, you got to do certain things 
to get by in life. You know, yeah. you got to work. You got to you got to get food on the table, and you have to have a roof over your head. So, um, so you got to do them things. But there's certain things that we think we need to do, but we actually don't really have to. Like you know, um, which is spending a certain amount of time with people to f get satisfied. Like you know, spending for, like 10, 15 hours with someone a week instead of condensing that into two quality hours. So. Um, and again, for me in business, it's about, it's for, you know, came across the concept of, you know, you don't have to work harder, you just have to work smarter. Yeah. And I, I suppose I brought that principle into all aspects of my life. Yeah. And uh, well, just to go back to the start, I suppose, a little bit, I mean, you got, you got into GAR really because you some ways were an outlet for the aggression, really. Mm. And you grew up not too far from where I grew up, but I grew up in Kulak. I know you were Ballymun as well. And this, I heard you talking on Paddy Hoolan's podcast about kick, trying to kick the ball over the flats. Yeah. And that's exactly the kind of shit we did. Yeah. You know, it's, it's no matter how the training starts with, with small little things like that. But at what yeah. point did, did you realise, I'm getting really good at this. I'm, you know, I probably have the right genetics to be a good athlete. It, you know, the rest of it's going to be mindset. Yeah, so I, I, I would have told the story a lot. I would have kicked the ball off the flats to see what my brother was doing. And um, that's initially how I picked up the football. And I lived in the four story flats, so uh, we got to an age where myself and a good friend of mine, Davy Bourne, who played with me all the way up through the age with Ballymun and, and played with Dublin with me, we used to kick the ball, we try, used to try to kick the ball over the four story flats. And then I got to the stage where we actually would go out to the tower block, which was 14 stories high, and we'd see how high we could kick it. Um, Did you ever hit your windows? Shift. Well, the funny thing is, actually, <laughs> when you, you have the two sides and you have kind of the lift shaft that goes all the way up and you have windows each side, and there was there would have been times where you kick the ball up and it'd go into someone's kitchen window. And in fairness, <laughs> the yeah, they'd have that window <laughs> open and whatever they were doing, you'd kick the ball up and it'd just drift in. And you go, oh, no. But the odds, the odd one you wouldn't get back. But most of the time, the neighbours would throw it back down. You know your kids just playing on the block and kicking the ball. So um, so, so the flats were their, their uh, buddies in terms of uh, the person that we didn't need really to kick the ball back. We had the flats to do that. So... Uh, that's where it started and obviously went to the, a lot of the way a lot of uh, GEA players develop through primary school into the local GEA club and then up through the ranks. But for me, I was very fortunate that I had a role model, uh, a sporting role model in Paddy Christie, who very smartly understood that the, the kids in Ballymun had this crazy energy that could be used in sport. And he adapted that for me in sport and that's how I kind of developed an aggression Towards my game and, and the style towards the way I play, because there's a there's a, the, the Ballymun team. It's Ballymun and uh, Glasnevin Glass as Nevin. well, isn't yeah. it? So and you, mm. would you notice the difference between which is literally it's right next to us. Yeah, and yeah. the difference between just even how people speak, uh, you know, they were just basically over the wall. There was something you noticed from a young age as well. We were kind of aware of. Oh, th these are kind of you know my age, but they're, they're somehow different. different. They're talking yeah. a bit differently. Like, yeah, it's the strange thing, and you know. Ballymun kind of falls under a bracket of like make, maybe mixing in between lower class and middle class and Glass Nevin then is probably middle class and to an extent small bit of upper class, you yeah. know, but it wouldn't be, be touching on that basically. But I, I felt that at a very young age, I don't know if it was the chip on my shoulder from where I came from or the, the, the low self-image I created from my environment and um, the values I basically developed probably from people that I was surrounding myself with. But I certainly felt that these kids over the wall had something more than we had, whatever that what may be, money, uh, houses, whatever it was. Um, so yeah, and, and certainly I got a better understanding of social class when I joined Ballywin Kickums because they were just normal. They were normal guys. They they certainly had a different look at look in life in that they were uh, striving in 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 ways that the kids in Ballymun weren't. In that they were looking to you know, for themselves in education. They were the guys that were talking about leaving certain points and going on to university. Um, whereas the Ballymun lads were kind of just like, let's get to leaving cert done. So, so the, there was just, and it doesn't mean that they're bad or they're, they're worse or, you know. Yeah. For, for us, it was just a different way of thinking. And certainly both of them kind of, they rubbed off each other. So yeah. we were very lucky that we had the two community two communities come into one in terms of Ballymun Kickums. And you made you made a point of going to college and, and getting your degree, even though you were doing really well business wise at mm. a very young age. You, you you kind of got into the strength and conditioning and the and the personal training very young. What was what why why that drive to 
to finish and get your degree, even though you really, you, you mm. were doing fine without it, and you would have done fine without it. I repeated me leaving cert, and I was, I had a car loan, I was, I had to, um, find a way to, to, to pay for the car while I was repeating me leaving cert. It was and a nice car as well. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> yeah, an Audi A4, bought up the north, and, and, uh, yeah, again, I was the typical Ballymun lad, I thought it was cool driving the car around, but I hadn't a penny in my pocket at, at a certain stage. So, for me, um, the reason why I, comp I was, I, I set up a gym because of that, um, because I was struggling financially and that was getting me through repeat me leaving cert. And for me, um, I suppose the, the the suffering that I had through, you know, repeat me leaving cert, all the sacrifice I made, uh, I could have, you know, I didn't I didn't need to complete a degree. Like you know, I had I had my my company. I was making money, and for me, it was it was just the it was the icing on on the on the the cake basically for me because I just wanted to I knew one day it would help somebody else I knew one day if I if I persevered and, and completed my degree that it would rub off on somebody else maybe in the community um or it was just one thing that I could say from the chip on my shoulder when I was younger that you know what I can do what other people could, you know talked about doing um so so that's where it stemmed from and there was a stage in, in my three year degree I done three years in DCU in uh, education and training there was a stage there that I would have said you know um why do I need to do this I'm making enough money in my career like but funnily enough only this year it's come back to to help me out with developing a, a course in Mount Joy for prisoners yeah I, I want to talk about that course as well like that's you're a couple of days a week in Mount Joy mm. I'll go back to the football stuff but you're a couple of days a week in Mount Joy um, how did the prisoners react to you and where did it come from that you were going to go into Mount Joy and it was going to be a consistent thing? It started from a guy called uh, Eddie Mullins, who is the governor now, um, standing governor now. And basically, he approached me after a match in Parnell Park and said, I'd love you to come in and, and do a talk for the guys. And for me, I just... I said I have to do this for this guy. But you must get a lot. You must get a lot of that stuff. Like yeah. We talked to Brezzy a bunch of times, and you know it's impossible to yeah. make everybody happy because there's a lot of those type of. Well, that's why I set up the charity, and that's why yeah. I I wrote the the, the book, the, the choice to to get all that information, so I didn't have yeah. to do all these talks. But I do get a lot. But the go the, the fact that he made an effort to come onto the pitch after the game, and I asked me, I was like, he's thinking he's thinking outside the box. I'm going to do that for him. So I did, and I went into Mount Joy, and uh, he said to me, look, Philly, he said, you could have five, you could have ten here. We just don't know. It's an optional thing, you know. They get out of cells at this time, and this is the time you're coming in, and we'll see how it goes. So it's cool, yeah. We'll just in. get some of the non-Dublin lads in to give you a stick. Yeah, yeah, you might get good. There's a lot of Cork lads there. Um, so basically what happened was I walked into the church, and it was packed, and I was like, whoa, this is, this is great, like, you know. So... I'm standing in front of them, and I'm saying, like, that, that's a good start, like, you know. And then I had a story and a script that I was going to, because I've I asked them, you know, what do you want me to, to add? Like, what do you want me to call it? A target and stuff like that. And in fairness to them, you just said, be yourself, like, you know, just tell your story. Yeah. And uh, I was about to say, tell the, the story, and, and I said to the lads, I said, look, lads, there's five, five of the lads in front of me that are in the story, so I'm not actually going to tell you, <laughs> but I'll, 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 I'll tell you why I'm here. So that's where it started. I got a huge reaction from that, and he said to me then, look, would you come in and train the guys um, once a week for 10, 10 to 15 weeks? And I said, yeah, yeah, come in. Uh, I said, but I'll, after a couple of weeks, I'll see how it's going, and if I feel I'm doing something for these guys, I'll continue on. Um, if not, I'll leave it. There's no point in me doing it. It's, it's not from a financial point of view or anything like that. It's just, you know, I... I if I'm gonna make an impact in these lads' lives, I, I, that'll fa that'll fascinate me. I'll be, you know, I'll be intrigued by that. So after a couple of weeks, I went back to him and I said, "Look, there's there's something really powerful, and, and there's a big opportunity here. Like, you know, there was there was a lot of guys doing a lot of good work culturally in the prison. Um, so Mount Joy, basically, um, you have the main jail, and then you have the the progressive unit, which is new. That used to be St. Pat's." For the, the guys, the young offenders, so that's completely changed. So if you're well behaved, or maybe you're a lifer, um, and you want to get on with your time, you go up to the progressive unit. And for me, I think everybody should go through the progressive unit because when you do, when you commit a crime, ultimately what happens is that you're punished through 
taking your liberty away. So you go in, you're ta they're taking your liberty away. And there's, there, there's supposed to be a rehabilitation aspect to that. And that's probably where the, the missing link is. So now they've looked at this and said, right, four people get out, let's go through this progressive progression unit, and that should hopefully help you reintegrate into society, therefore helping you not come back in here, right? But that's not the case. So essentially, um, I went in and I said, I'd love to get involved in this, and I think there's something special here. And in a prison, you know, the culture is all around, it's a negative culture, it's all around ego, it's all around um, bravado, and, there's, and the biggest one is fear, right? Everybody does everything on fear. Um, all, the, all the actions and all the choices are based around that. And this progressing unit is the total opposite. There's a, still a little bit of that there, but it's a really good place. There's lads doing really good things. For example, uh, there was a guy there that we, we're constantly trying to get people to join into the group because we want this... We want to show, first of all, the good things that are happening and make them become the norms. Whereas it's the opposite now, the bad things are the norms. Because people don't see enough of something. Like, I didn't know that unit existed yeah. until you just told me. You know, mm. It's easy to look and go, oh, the joy. Yeah. You know, they're in prison, obviously they did something, that's why they're in prison. Yeah. And that's a mentality, obviously, you're keen on changing. But yeah. There are lads there who've made mistakes and they were just looking you know, to turn it around, do their time and grow on with their lives. Well, the funny thing is, we all make mistakes and we're all wrong. Um, some some just make bigger mistakes. Some some people are more wrong than others. Um, I might get people saying, "What are you doing in there? You're you're helping drug dealers or murderers or whatever else." But in fact, no matter what crimes these guys have committed, when they get out, ultimately we don't want them to commit more crime, and we don't want more victims. We want them to be society. rehabilitated. Yeah. Exactly. We want them to become normal, abiding citizens. You know. So for me. Um, there's a purpose behind it, and and I think there's a there's a huge opportunity, and I'm telling these guys week in week out, you know, wouldn't it be amazing that you were part of a group that changed the culture in the prison, changed the culture in the prison? Where would you ever see that in the world? Like the norm is to take drugs, uh, be violent, you know, constantly break the rules, and now you have this, which is like no, these guys are having the choice of. Uh, you know, going down the, the right road. Something you hear over and over again, or, or that I hear, maybe it's my own ignorance, is that people go into prison, you know, they come out of prison tougher mm. than they went into prison, or come, come out of prison better criminals than, than when they went into prison. Mm. Is it, that, that's the thinking behind that progressive unit, or, you know, it's the broader thinking behind it, I suppose, is rehabilitation, a bit of education, and, you know, give them all the tools that they need to be on the outside, because some of these guys would have been away for a long time, right? Mm. Well, yeah, a lot of them will become institutionalised, so yeah. they get up at certain times. And that's a whole other thing as well. Yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy. Like, for example, one of the guys in my group got out last week, and, and I met him for a coffee, and, and uh, he says to me, you know what, you know, I really have understood the simple things in life. You know, um, he said, I actually enjoyed my girlfriend giving out to me during the day. <laughs> <laughs> she could so, do it to my face. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so he says, I loved walking the dog. And, and that's, that's what it's about. And... Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that will get out of prison and they will go back down. It's just, it's just yeah. they haven't changed their belief system. Okay, so that's what we're working on, changing the belief system of the individual force so that 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 ultimately will alter the external factors, the external environment. Yeah. So if the person doesn't change who they are and what they believe in when they get out, they will ultimately connect with the same things, right? But if they change that, they'll alter that, then they'll they'll change the environment. They'll change the external factors around what 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 they want to do in life. So, it's a it's a really powerful program, and um, we're very lucky that we're, we're getting good support from uh, from the governor. Um, you know, because it's I suppose for him, it's he has to do his job, and but he understands that there's something there that could be could could impact uh, society. Like. Yeah, where where did this? Uh where does this idea come from, or this practice come from? Where, you, like, even when you're going back to when you're talking about your degree, like this can help mm. other people. Mm. That's how that's not how most people think about getting a degree. Most people think about getting a degree, getting a career, making money, and, and living their own lives. Mm. You were thinking of the community and other people from a very young age. Yeah. Like, where did this come from? About not just the media family, but our people around you, but people from your area, and you know, people who need help. Mm. 
I'm not too sure. I, I, I could say, I could guess it could come from the values my parents gave me, um, the values that maybe coaches have given me throughout the years. Um, but I think, I feel that it's a, it's, it's, for me, it's a purpose in life. It's, it's something that I like doing and something that I get a buzz for doing. And I'm all for that. You know, if you find something that you enjoy doing and you love, go for it, you know. So um, I think it's having a deeper understanding what life's about. And when you go into Mount Joy week in, week out, you understand life really quickly. Like, Perspective. You know? yeah, right there, yeah, yeah. So um, I, think, I think that's the way that the world is going. Like, you know, it's about understanding each other rather than, you know, look, at we're in a consumer culture now. Like, you know, where we're always, um, we always, believe that we have to be better than everybody else. It's, a, it's kind of a chauvinistic culture. And, and for me, you know, I would like to be the opposite. Like in, in, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm perfect in any way, shape or form, but I'd like to think that, um, that I'm not that person that, that is materialistic, that I, I have a deeper meaning on, on what life should be about and what way I should treat people and, and help people. And what about then the team aspect too? Because obviously you've, you've been playing Ga for years and years at this point before you got to the elite level that you're at now. Did the team aspect kind of seed out that individualism down? It's like you, you can't be an individual. You need to play play for your team. Is that something that had a reverberation and, a, and an impact on you outside of just playing football? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's the great thing about a team sport that you represent the group, you know. You constantly see MMA fighters and they're shouting out and they, you know they have a team around them, but it doesn't really massively impact. You're in there on your own. They can say what they want, which is which is a good thing as well, like, you know. Whereas if I say something out of order, it's it impacts the group, like you know. So you you have standards then, you know. You have standards and you have values that you have to, you know, you know you understand that you're you're a part of a bigger team, um, and that you're responsible for others. You know, and, and for me, when you put the blue jersey on for Dublin, it's it's a special moment because you represent your family, your community, and the wider audience, the Dublin wider audience. So you have a you have an impact somehow, shape or form. And do you think that's a part of that pride that comes with playing for your county is you don't often see that with something like football. And football is the obvious comparison because mm. of the money involved with football. And naturally gifted athletes can gravitate towards any sport and they can make more money from some than, than others. Yeah. But is that, is that a massive difference that you see there? Yeah, yeah. Um, like, because you, you know, you're from Dublin, you can only play for Dublin Basic. Yeah. Mm. You have a sense of belonging. Yeah, no transfer you know. window. No, there's no <laughs> transfer window. No, you have a sense of belonging. So you fight, you fight a little bit harder yeah. for things. And when you fight a little bit harder for things, it's because they mean more to you, you know? So um, in the soccer world that we see today, it's, the loyalty and the you know it's it's not really there because and and it's rightly so because the the the, the club will get rid of you as quick as you want to move move to another yeah, club. Yeah, it's as not well. just so the players. Yeah, yeah, it, it works both ways, and it's it's happening today in the Electricity League in, in Ireland. So uh, that's the special thing about you. Yeah? It really is. It's it's unique in that sense. Um, and I, I don't really see any other sports in the world that are like that. You know. But you were nearly, were you, you weren't nearly an MMA fighter, but I know you were, you were talking about renting the downstairs to own Roddy, it was mm. his first gym. He was obviously yeah. one of the best striking coaches in the world now at this point. At any at any point, did you did you think about giving it a bash? You trained a bit, right? Yeah, like, I mean, when I first started, I, well, I, I tell you, I first started doing boxing when I was younger. And uh, I was actually, funnily enough, what happened was I was sparring a, 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 a kid and, and I got the better of him. And the coach was so, so bad it was really bad coaching. The coach put his older brother in. And so I was the same age as the other kid. And yeah. He put his older brother in because I got the better of him. And then the older brother bashed me. Like, and I never went back. Like, I felt like, why am I going to go in there to get bashed every time? And I didn't understand as a kid that, you know, maybe that would help me. Like, you know. Yeah. But I kind of just lost interest in boxing. So I always wanted to get back into it. And, you know, I, picked, I was playing soccer and I was playing hurling and I was playing football. Uh, and... I kind of always wanted to get into it and there was a couple of lads from Ballymun that were going out to uh, Paddy Clint doing toy boxing to Chupasart and uh, I was doing that on the long mile road and John, SPG was below that, it was in a small tiny room so I was walking in, I know Roddy from Ballymun and he was rolling on the ground I was like, hmm, that's interesting, what's that? And it, like USC was like, 
was at that stage it was probably you know that way they were pulling hair and they were out the loaf and all that <laughs> sort of stuff <laughs> so we'd done the toy boxing for a, for a little bit and but i always wanted to do the mma and then roddy was looking to set up a place in ballymore and i was like i have a studio downstairs do you want to use that and then i can jump in and do the classes so you know win win two yeah boards, one stone so so we did it for a while and and, and i was actually I was all right in the sense of the the standard of lads that were there, and because I was I had the the physical attributes from sport, and then a couple of years later I got back every off season, uh, pre you know to do a little bit pre season training because it was inefficient to my body so I really got gains from it and the lads just kept getting better <laughs> they just kept getting better technically and I was still strong and I was still athletic, but these boys were just technically going like through the roof and I was like ah. Oh. You know, so yeah. at that stage, then I realised, you know, you need to grab, you need to put it. It's a, it's a, you need to put time and effort into you know, into this to, to to master the skill of MMA because there's so many different styles. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, but it's like anything in life to be exceptional. That's something you have to give time and effort. Yeah. And uh, I don't think I'd ever have enough time or effort to give in another sport. Certainly at the age I'm at now to to take it on yeah. to that level. You know. And then you wrote a book. And uh, won an award, I'm sure a bunch of awards. Mm. Uh, one of the best-selling sports books, I think, in Irish history. Something insane mm. like that as well. Were you surprised that the book had the kind of impact that it had? You because know, it's obviously a deeply personal book. The guy that, that the guy from Gill that came to me, uh, there was a, there was four companies that came to me to write a book, and none of them, one of them nearly had. What did I they know your you. story? Did they know your background and stuff? Was that why? Yeah, yeah. A, a couple of them did, but um, my, most of them kind of hit on hit on the the, the sport and side of things, and I was like, nah, not a chance. I don't want to do a sports book. I've no interest in it. Dublin players don't really do them in any way. Um, so and certainly Dublin players that are still playing don't do them. Like you know, so I was like, nah, no interest. And this guy came to me and he said. I really don't care about the sport end of it. He says, I think your story can help people. And I was like, well, you've, you've ticked the box in terms of what I'm thinking as well. So uh, I didn't know how well it do in terms of selling, you know, and that was, I was, I was shocked at that. It done really well in that respect. And, but it's the little things. I constantly get mailed, constantly get letters, constantly people coming up to the streets. Like, I was at the Bowes game, as I said, and, and you had people coming up going, I read your book and it's helped me and I've had uh, two brothers that were struggling with, with drugs. That's the stuff that I was like, that was well worth doing that. And ultimately, you know, it was also not, you know, it was to help people, but it was also for me to, you know, get the story into yeah. some sort of a platform so that I didn't have to go and talk to the world about it, you know, yeah. because it does dilute at that stage. I mean, but then you have to go and go and promote the book as well, and you're doing the late late show and all that yeah, stuff yeah. too, which is the biggest platform we have in this country. And mm. um, but you know, then it comes back to that you have that confidence in speaking, you know what you want to say, and it is your story after all as well. Yeah. Um. Okay. So I want to go to the the last All Ireland final there. So there's, it's six at this point, right? It's been six, four, yeah. been four yeah, in a row. Yeah. Uh, it was a kind of it was an emotional kind of end to this one as well because I thought it was a lovely tribute to your dad as well. Mm. It was obviously a very personal one yeah. because of the, the Breaking Bad, Walter White thing there. How did, how did that come about? How did the, your dad obviously resembled uh, Walter White? Walter White. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was probably 2015, maybe 2016 in All-Ireland and I don't know what platform it was. Someone on social media, one of the platforms on social media spotted my dad and, and took a picture and it was like, Look at Walter White's in Crow <laughs> Park, like the image of him. Like, no know. idea that yeah. it was your dad. Yeah, and then I was getting bombarded with the picture being sent to me saying, look, your dad's all over. Like, so my dad was, uh, he was loving it. He was loving it. So he, he says to me one day, he says, uh, he says, look, I'm famous. Like, look at the, look, I'm on, the, I'm on all the platform, I'm on social media. All my nieces were showing him and all. And he says, come on, we could, he didn't realise, like, you know, he says, come on, we could out to O'Connell Street. And we sell, uh, we get pictures and we sell them for a five. Everybody think I'm all the way. <laughs> and I was like, nah, I wouldn't work for that, you know. But, but he's like, we, we, get, we make a five or each for each picture and we give it to your charity. And, and I was just like, you're playing bonkers. But yeah, uh, he was diagnosed with cancer last year um, and fought for the year. Gave me many lessons along that journey. And obviously I was very grateful for the lads that gave me the gift of, you know, him seeing us lifting the Sam Maguire last year, you know. Wasn't there this year, I, would, I wouldn't be very religious, but I'm very spiritual, yeah. and I think he was there in spirit. And 
a friend, Tomas uh, Newham, who's a big MMA fan, he had a T-shirt. Yeah, 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 great guy. And he threw the T-shirt over. and uh, It was quite emotional because last year we got... We got a, we were allowed to go on the pitch, just me and him, after one of the games. I think it was the Leinster final, or league final was one of them. And it was it was a nice moment with the two of us just sitting down on the pitch and just the stadium empty, like, yeah. and just in the middle of Crow Park, just chilling out. Like, there are moments you just, so. you can't write those. No, you, know? you can't, you can't, no. And I think that's a big problem we have in life. We just need yeah. to slow down and, and capture these moments and make sure that they're in the memory bank, you know, because that, that, makes you happy in, in life, I suppose. For me, it didn't anyway. I have that picture, you know, I have that in my phone, I have it in my head. And, you know, bereavement and adversity and death is, is gonna, it's gonna be inevitable, it's around us all, you know, and we gotta be able to deal with it and certainly being able to have their moments is very special. And you, you said, you mentioned there as well, your dad wanted to sell the t-shirts for charity. Yeah, is, yeah. You know, you mentioned your parents and the kind of, you know, what they installed in you and, and mm. helping other people. That, that, that's where that came from, obviously. Mm. Yeah, my dad. Let's sell t-shirts yeah. and, and give it to yeah, him. Yeah, that's what he, he was thought thinking of. that when he was sick. He, he didn't really, uh, he wasn't very materialistic. My mom was very materialistic in that she'd give you her last penny to make you happy, you know. She'd give you, she'd buy you these big presents or whatever. I was the youngest kid in, in, uh, of a family of five and I was the spoiled child, I suppose, in, in many ways. But yeah, my dad, he was the, the typical traditional father who worked, gave the, came home, gave the money to my mum and didn't really care about materialistic things, you know. As uh, long as his kids were happy and the missus was happy. Yeah, he used to he used to save his coins every week and uh, he'd have a big bin of coins and he'd, he used to do it with me and then he passed it down to the grandkids where you have a lucky dip where you'd go in and you'd put your hand like a, one of the machines where you grab a teddy. Yeah. And, as much coins you can grab, you stick in your pocket. Like so, he was good at them little things. But he again, he uh, he gave me many lessons in life. Did you have groceries in Ballymun? We, we, we did, yeah. We after did. Debs or oh, after, 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 after a yeah. wedding, I, yeah. I said that to somebody recently with them in Kula, yeah. and they looked at me like I was mental. They're like, "What's a groceries?" Yeah, Try the coins. After like, we were literally after kids after going waiting outside, car, waiting outside car windows, with the throw <laughs> yeah. money on the ground. When you, when yeah. you think back, it's mental, yeah. isn't it's it? Brilliant. I don't have to do that anymore, do they? I don't know. I don't think so. I love There's it. There's probably a law against that it. or something like yeah. that somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, no, yeah, they're the times. So I, I want to talk about the gym as well. So you, when did you open your, your new place? I opened my new place in January yeah. this year. And this, this place is in Fingless as well. It's so in it's, Fingless, it's, it's the M50. It's a strength, strength conditioning. It's well, it's, um, yeah, the style of training we use is strength and conditioning. Um, but I'd like to think we're a little bit different than what we do. Yeah. And, and the difference would be that um, we're kind of holistic in what we do. So we get people to come in the door and we, there's three areas that we focus on. Their movement, their body composition, their strength. And we give them a number based off that. So it's a Venn diagram. But, um, but ultimately what we're trying to do is the purpose of, of my company and my gym is to try to change people's emotions. So when they come in the door, they're either feeling good or bad. And when they go out, they're feeling much better, no matter what that is. So that's what the B do stands for. Be yourself. Come in and be in an environment that you can just let loose. Forget about all the problems you've had that week or that day. And then just do a little bit more. Do a little bit more. And the seven then is the system that we have. So that's the numbers, the strength, the movement, the body composition. So it's very unique in its own way. Um, it's been 10 years in the making. So it's I've had my company open 10 years. And this is the dream gym that I wanted. Um, we have a movement studio. We have a spinning studio. We have a boxing studio. Uh, so it's really cool, and everybody wears heart rate monitors, so we're yeah. monitoring what their, what kind of intensity they're coming. There's science in behind it, yeah. Yeah, all science. People can kind of smile. People can train like professional athletes now. You yeah. know, you know, outside of outside of whatever their day jobs are, their families are. They can go train twice a day and train yeah. like professional athletes. So if we didn't have a few years ago. Yeah, well, uh, for me, it's um, the, the the idea is that again, the biggest problem we have in life is one of the biggest problems we have in life is time. You know, you know, we we're talking about it at the start. So if these guys are going to give me an hour that day, I want to make sure that that hour is the most valuable hour they get. And I'm going to give, my trainers are going to give you their energy, you're going to give me your energy back. So, and then we need to show that. Like you are, look, look at your heart rate monitor, look where it's going, look at the zones you're in. So I think that's the purpose, that's what we're trying to do is look, if you're going to give us three hours a week, they're going to be the best three hours you can give us energy wise. So I say there's a lot of lads as well, a lot of people who want to train. Oh, Philly McMahon, I want to, I want to train with Philly McMahon. Yeah. Do you take classes as well and you train people? Yeah, well? I try I to try get in now. Um, I would have got, I would have obviously, when I first began, I would have, 
you know, the big thing in the fitness industry is that when, you, when you're a good fitness instructor or a good PT, you think you can open a business. But then you don't realise all the aspects of the bi what, what it takes to run a business, the sales, the, oper the, the operations, the customer service, uh, the accounts, all that sort of stuff comes into play. Like, you know? So I'm really happy that I've got to a stage where I used to have to teach 30 odd hours a week and now I only have to teach three or four hours. And that's just to get my head in the door and make sure everybody sees I'm there and I'm looking around seeing what's working, what's not working. And I'm very fortunate that I've got to a stage where I have a company that's has people in all them areas. So my job is to strategically grow the company and, and to learn every day. So yeah. every day I'm reading, every day I'm I'm listening to podcasts. Uh, that's that's what that's what my job is. Yeah. Um, and going going forward, how much is, do you have a time frame on how much longer you want to keep playing football as well? Because there's only like you said, there's only so many units you can give. Yeah. And the business is going to keep growing, but it sounds good as well. Mm. Might be another book at some point. Given how well, <laughs> given how well the last book is done, <laughs> yeah. it's like Hollywood. Everybody wants a sequel. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, like t talking about football, talking about all this other stuff. Is there is there an end? Like I mean, you know, we're still young. It's obviously mm. a while off. But are you looking at the end goal here as well? Oh yeah, I've always been. Uh, I'd say from probably I started my career with Dublin two thousand and nine, the senior team two thousand and sorry eight, uh, and I would say about two or three years into my career, I was thinking of what's next after that. You know, and I was constantly, obviously, being in the present while I'm playing, but I'm constantly thinking of the next platform. You know, uh, I'm very fortunate that sport has given me the platform to help people, to help my business. And for me, uh, I know eventually the day is going to come. Like, you know, it's going to end. You just physically can't compete at that level. So that depends on a lot of variables. That depends on the players coming through, the management, whether they want my services anymore, whether they say injury free. What I perform, so there's a lot of variables around that. Um, if you're if you're looking at the players and the averages of when people are retiring, it's probably around 33, 34, 35, depending on the position you play. If you're Stephen Cluxon, it's probably 50s. He was in my year yeah. in Davis's as yeah. well. Yeah. Like if he retires, he's my canary in the coal mine. Yeah. Like that Adley thing's never happened <laughs> no. for me now. <laughs> yeah, so so if you're a goalkeeper, you'll probably last a little bit longer. Um, so it just depends again if you're successful as well. If the team's winning, it also helps. It's funny no. talking to like friends who are retired athletes, like friends who are professional footballers and retired, and I know you do as well. Mm. The one thing they miss the most, apart from they've all gotten really fat afterwards as well, because yeah, like, yeah, yeah. they just think everything is done for them because <laughs> yeah. it is when you're when you're playing football like diet and all that stuff. Yeah. The one thing they miss the most is is the lads. They miss the mm. lads in the changing room. Yeah. And that's something as well. I know you're you know, prison is obviously an extreme example of it, mm. but there's a institutionalization there as well, with yeah. people coming out of a professional sport going. Uh, I don't know. I'm missing something here. How do I get, well, then Neil yeah. Ruddock was saying he didn't know how to go go, go to doctor. He literally had no <laughs> idea how to go to doctor. Yeah, he probably used the team doctor. Yeah, also. exactly, yeah, for so yeah. long. Yeah, like, um, and the, the probably worst sport for that is GAA because when you when you finish your career, you're gone. That's it, done. You, like, you don't get invited to any awards, you, you know, you, you don't, you know, you just, you're gone. Like, there's no testimonial, well, there was one last year, I think the year before, but there's none of that. Like, there's, it's a sport that when you're gone, you pass the jersey on to the next person, and that's it. You have to kind of accept <laughs> that, like you know. So it's quite tough, and I'm sure. Um, and I tell you, the biggest, the, the biggest problem what I find is that the commitment of not having kids. I think mean, that's a huge thing. Like, yeah. There's very few lads on the Dublin team that have kids, and if they do, they're they're. I have to take my hat off to them, they're unbelievable yeah. men because like, of the time you have to obviously gift your kids and, yeah. and sport and whatever else. But for me, the big thing was, my dad was great with kids, great with his grandkids, and I would have seen him with my nieces and nephews and, and grandnieces, and it was just amazing. And I'll never get that. You know, I'll never get that time back where yeah. he was able to play with my kids because I sacrificed playing a sport and I understood that that time I had to give to sport instead of having a family. And it's know? mad, even if you look at like the emergence of, you know, like the ladies GAA is blown up in a massive yeah. way now, and that's a choice that they have to make too. Mm. Or it, like we're talking about MMA, like female MMA fighters, you know, like it's a yeah. real life decision that you have to make. And it's like, look, this is either going to happen for me later in life or, or not yeah. at all. It's kind of a scary mm. decision to make. It is, yeah. Well, really, it's the girlfriends, the wives, that, and, and, and the boyfriends and, in those cases, yeah, yeah. yeah, that make the sacrifice. Like you know, they're the one we love doing it, so it's kind of easier for us. Whereas they don't really like they love it, but they don't really. It's not them that are doing it, so it's kind of tough for them. And you know, you don't go in holidays. You, 
probably and it's a, obviously when you're having kids it's a, it's a yeah. I'll get into trouble if I don't say it's, <laughs> it's a choice for both yeah. uh, my girlfriend and me when we were able to decide but it is, uh, it is tough when you think about it that way you know and you, you, you'd say sometimes you talk on social media and people go oh well you sacrifice the, that's what you get when you want to play at that level and everything else but people from the outside of inter-county level, they mightn't see that side of things. Yeah, I mean, you get to walk out, you know, there's very few people at your level as well who get to walk out with Croker in an mm. All-Ireland final. That doesn't happen for everybody, but that yeah. doesn't mean they don't make the same sacrifice. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, Philly, look, I think, I think we'll leave it there. Like, I'm, I'm exhausted listening to you, <laughs> and I also feel like I should be doing more for my community. Yeah. I, need, I, need, I need to go back to Coolock. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> You're a good man, Philly. Thanks, Thanks so for coming Cheers, in. Appreciate it. it. Thank you.